during this series, we talked about uh, the first week, we really began to discuss the reality that God is for us. And um, that is such a challenging concept sometimes where we find ourselves in places where we feel like we have to search or, or, or try to find God's approval. You know, like, like one of the points that I made in that message is one of the, it's a powerful reality, but so many of us run and hide from God when we should run to God. And so we need to make the determination that he's for us, that he's with us, that he knows what's best for us, and that he's working for our sake, and, and, and we need to seek after him. And the, the next week, we talked about the reality that God is with me. And that took two weeks because Connie shared, and it was just a powerful testimony. If you did not get a chance to hear that, I would encourage you to get online and check out our video of that so that you can, can see or, or we have an audio as well. You can see or hear what Connie had experienced and the overwhelming truth that through all that she had been through, God had overwhelmingly said, I'm here. I've never abandoned you. I've never left you. I've never walked away from you. I've never, I've never excused myself from your life. I've always participated in everything. And we've got to realize, I mean, more than, more than experiencing what we hope for immediately, more than the answer to prayer immediately, more than something working out the way we want it to, to me, it is more important for me to know that God is with me. Even when things don't play out the way that I want them to or the way that I hope they would. To know that God is with me just, it helps us. We talked about, you know, like with a child, you know, being a parent of four kids, I know that presence makes all the difference. And I'm not talking about gifts. I'm talking about being there. Like when you're with a kid, it's, it's just different. When they're overwhelmed or anxious or, or having a challenge, they don't necessarily need an answer. But man, when their parent is there holding them and they have presence with their parent, it just it calms, it soothes, it brings peace. And last week we talked about a God who can do anything. A God who can do anything. The word almighty is mentioned 345 times in the Bible. And almighty literally means absolute power or unlimited power or all powerful. The religious word for that is omniscient. God is huge. And he is big and we've got to trust a big God. A big God who made a child and a virgin mother and brought him to this earth so that we could be set free. That's, that's the all-powerful God I'm talking about. That's the God who can do anything. He saw us in need. He saw us desperate. He saw us alone and broken that our greatest attempt to please him and to enter heaven would never be enough. So he did what only perfect and loving father would is he sent someone to take the cost for us or to take the price that we should pay in our place. And so as we're leading up towards Christmas, I want to talk about God's son. My God gave his son. My God gave his son. I don't know what it is about this time of year, but sometimes we find ourselves completely desensitized to what this really means. And I know that there's some speculation and you know different things going on. We don't know if Jesus was born necessarily around this time of year, but we know that this is the time that we celebrate his birth. And it's and it's 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 the things that we get so caught up in this time of year that causes us to lose the truth of how significant this moment is. Like, like we're talking about having the faith of a child. Have you, ever, have you ever seen the excitement and the anticipation of a kid who's waiting for that one thing that they've been longing for all year long? Uh, you know... It's the, you know, things are changing now, but for me, when I was a kid, I mean, it was that, it was that one G.I. Joe, I can still remember his name, his name was Beachhead, and, and, and I wanted him so bad, and I remember, my family didn't have much, but I had two items at the tree that year, one of them was a smaller package, and one of them was the, uh, a little Jeep for the guy. And I was so excited. I ripped open that package so full of anticipation. And I remember getting that and feeling so elated that I got that one gift that I'd been longing for all this time. Hoping for. Just, I really, I was desperate. I mean, I was four, five. I can't remember exactly. But, you know, 
And so this, this, this one thing that I wanted so bad, and it was almost like, I mean, it was cool when I had it, but the anticipation of that moment was even more thrilling. The, the excitement and the thrill and the, and the joy and, the, and you know, the, just the, 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 oh, it's coming, it's going to happen, I'm going to get it, I'm going to get it. And, and, and as a child, when we come up towards Christmas, we can experience moments like that where, where we're just like, oh, I can't wait. And that moment comes. And, and, and I want to ask you this morning, if we'd be, be sincere, I mean, a lot of us are expecting some things for Christmas this year, um, you know, but more than any kind of physical thing that we could receive or any kind of, 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 of item that we could receive in our hand, I think that maybe a lot of us this year are hoping to receive something that can only be given by the Prince of Peace. Like, if... If we were honest today, a lot of us are in a place where we would be fine if we didn't receive any wrapped gifts under the tree, if we didn't receive a thing from anyone, just as long as we receive that one thing, that one thing that can't be bought but is freely given. The, the one thing that, that Jesus, that, that God did for us through his son, the price that he paid for us, and some of us look to heaven as, as, and, and we see God up there and we see him in this almighty present place and in this big throne in the sky saying, you know, thinking to ourselves, I brought you into this world, I can take you out of it. <laughs> and we're so concerned sometimes that he's just waiting for the right moment to stick it to us, to give us what we deserve. But everything about mercy, everything about grace, everything about what he did through his son, Jesus, is the opposite. He did everything for us that we didn't deserve. He gave us a gift that we could have never afforded on our own. We could have never bought ourselves. Never. And so we find ourselves at, this event, at these events, and, and just to give you guys kind of a lead up to that, he could have looked down from that big throne in the sky and said, I'm done, I'm finished. He created opportunity for life from the darkest of moments. The book of Zechariah was written, and, and the, the moments of that were experienced 500 years before Christ was born. Like, I want you to understand that for just a minute. In that time period, it had been 500 years from, as, as far as the scriptures are determining, that it had been 500 years since people have heard a prophecy from God. And they're wondering to themselves, has he given up on us? Is he done? Has he said, I'm, I'm done with a whole lot of them. They can, they can destroy themselves and I'll just stand back and watch. But then at that moment, something magical happens, something amazing happens, something so incredible happens that the Son of God is born in the earth. And I want to take a look at two characters this morning that we don't normally see in the nativity scene. We, we see the wise men, we see the shepherds, we see Jesus, you know, the, 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 the most important role there in, is, you know, Joseph and Mary and, and all the animals and so on and so forth, but, but you know, we, but th there's these two individuals that experience something truly joyful because of their anticipation. Um, they were waiting for something. And this morning, I want to ask you that same, that same question. In the final acts of the Christmas drama, you find these two people, Simon and Anna. And Simon and Anna were, were, were hoping for something. They were believing for something. They were waiting for something. And, and this year, what are you waiting for? I want to ask you that question. What are you waiting for? What are you hoping to receive from the Lord? You see, Simon was waiting for comfort. If you go to Luke 2, 2, 25 through 26, it says, At that time there was a man in Jerusalem named Simon, and he was a righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come to rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him, and he revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. You see, I want you to get a picture of, an image of what was going on. They were under Roman rule. There, there was political, they, they had lost their political independence, and they were living in fear of a capable, crafty, and cruel King Herod. And Simon's expectation focused on the comfort that Christ would bring. Among the Jews of Simon's day, one of the most popular titles of Messiah was simply comforter. 
And that's what Simon was waiting for. That's what Simon was hoping for. That was what Simon was longing for. It strikes me that we are living in a time right now that, that the desire to be comforted is a universal human need. We all struggle with loneliness and emptiness and insecurity. And instead of Christmas being a time that increases joy and hope and peace, it tends to increase the other. We're living in a world where the holiday season causes greater doubt, greater darkness, greater depression and fear, greater loneliness. I, there, there are people that I've come in contact with that, 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 that I recognize just from, I mean, there's, there's patterns that we face through the seasons, and it's common at this time of year more than any other that depression and suicide are a real factor at a time when we should be celebrating the coming of a Messiah. At a time that we should be celebrating as Simon was, the comforter that was to come. And so Simon, prompted by the Spirit, went to the temple courts just at the right time. And then in Luke 2, 28 through 32, this is what happens. When Simon was there, and he took the child in his arms, and he praised God. He took Jesus into his arms, which is just kind of, you know, I mean, he just kind of reached out and grabbed him from his parents. <laughs> and he said, Sovereign Lord, now let the servant die in peace, as you've promised. He was good. He didn't have to live another day. He's like, I'm all right. I'm, I'm fine. I'm holding the Messiah now. I'm holding the Savior. You gave me what I promised. I can, go to de- I can go to bed and die a happy man. Verse 30, I have seen your salvation. 31, which you have prepared for all people. He is the light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of all or of, of your people Israel. And so Simon was waiting for comfort. Now, Anna was waiting for forgiveness. Anna was this woman whose husband had died, and ever since he had passed away, she had dedicated herself to being in the temple and fasting and praying. And if you follow Anna's story, she had been there all the time. Anna stayed at the temple. She prayed and she fasted. She's seeking forgiveness. She, she's looking for, for something that only a Messiah can offer. And in Luke 2, 38, it says she came along just as Simon was talking with Mary and Joseph. And she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. Another translation says it this way. She was waiting for redemption which is related to the idea of captivity. The Old Testament Passover and the release of Israel from Egyptian slavery stood in Anna's day as the ultimate redemption, a symbol of God's power to release people from captivity. Passover pointed ahead to that day when God would provide deliverance from the slavery of sin. And she was hoping for that. And she heard, she overheard what was going on. She saw that Simon was praising God and she overheard this woman who's been fasting and praying and she walked up and realized just before her everything that she'd been hoping for, everything that she'd been longing for, everything that she deeply desired was right there. Jesus is everything. He's all that we need. He's it. The gospel is central to everything that we do as a church. It's not about some mystical higher power God. It's about a God who is powerful, who decided to send his son to the world to walk this world and die for a people who are undeserving. But Jesus is it. What are you waiting for this Christmas? Can you identify with Simon? Are you, are you really hurting right now? Do you feel lonely? Do you feel empty? Do you feel afraid? Or are you like literally maxed out and in need of comfort? Maybe some consoling. How about a fresh sense of God's presence? Remember we're talking about the faith of a child. The faith of a child believes that believes that God is with them, believes that God comforts. I mean, I can't count to you the amount of times that, that my children come to me and say, you know, Dad, they're just overwhelmed, and I just sit down or kneel down right where I'm at and grab their hands and we pray, and, and it's, a, it's immediate almost. I mean, you could just see the, the release fall off their face, and they're just like, oh, so much better now because they have no doubts. 
Well, we're we're kind of like at this tug of war. We're like, God's with me. God's maybe not. Maybe, you know, let, let's, let's back and forth for a little while until finally God tries to tug it out of our hands or, or we just we give up altogether. Or, or are you like Anna? Are you plagued with guilt this Christmas because something you've done or the way you've been living? And you're trapped in a pattern, and that pattern is leaving you in bad places. And it's not simply just mistakes. You're actually sinning, and you're willful about it, and you could care less. And your heart's broken by what you've been doing. Your heart is devastated by what you've been doing. You know, I, I want to I mention three things this morning. Three simple things that, that we need to do to have the childlike faith you need to take these action steps. The first thing that we got to do is become a marveler. And Joseph and Mary tried to process everything that was happening. And verse 33 says that they marveled at what was said about Jesus. And Luke 2.33, it says the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Marvel literally means to be filled with wonder, astonishment, or surprise. Remember that, remember that astonishment, incitement, and surprise I was talking about at the beginning here? That, that we can get so excited, so thrilled, so moved, so, so just filled up with excitement and anticipation. A lot of us have just kind of lost that. A need comes along and we're just kind of like him hauling through like, oh, I guess I got to pray. Let's hope that God does something about this because this really stinks. Uh, when's the last time you really sat back and marveled at him and thought, wow, wow, I'm filled with wonder. Wow, I'm filled with astonishment. Wow, I'm filled with surprise. Are you a marveler this Christmas or are you to- too caught up in the busyness and stress of the season of this holy day? Has it become too predictable and too familiar? This is an amazing moment, guys. This is an opportunity for us to celebrate again and again and again. This is something that we should celebrate all the time, but I really believe that at this time of year, instead of being maxed out and overwhelmed and depressed, we should marvel at what Jesus did for us. I mean, this moment is like something for for fairy tales, but it's not a fairy tale. It's real. A virgin visited by angels, told that she's going to have a child, told that she was going to be carrying the Son of God. That's crazy. But it happened. And the, these, these, these shepherds hearing from angels and worshiping these wise men, seeing a star. I mean, who does that? I don't know where to go. I'm just going to follow that big bright light in the sky and see where it takes me. When is the last time you marveled at the king? When is the last time the Christmas story has caused you to marvel? Hmm. <laughs> This could be a dangerous time of year for us because our annual celebration of Christmas can immunize us to its reality. We hear just enough for the story each year to inoculate us against the real thing so that we never really truly catch Christmas fever. I mean, seriously. Like, I want you guys to just, like, like a child, I mean, like, like, like with the excitement and thrill that they come to Christmas morning waiting to rip open a package for the gift that they're about to receive. I'm like, oh, what are you going to do this year, God? <laughs> you know what, Lord, I'm not even going to ask you for anything. I'm just going to let you do your thing and allow you to marvel me. I'm, I'm just going to be marveled simply by the fact that your son was born born with a mission and a plan. Nothing like this. Nothing like this had ever happened. To become a a person with childlike faith, you got to marvel again. We're too desensitized. We hear this story over and over again. We set up our nativity, and it's just all too familiar. We watch our Christmas movies, and they're all too familiar. We sing our Christmas songs, and we don't even recognize the words that are coming out of our mouth. 
I mean, some of us are just kind of like in motion. Oh, come, let us adore him. And we don't even realize how significant that is. You ever, you ever see a child marvel at something that just like, I mean, they're just sponges. They're like something they'd never seen before. And they're just like, wow. Just grabs them and they're, they're brought in and they just, they're so amazed and awed. When's the last time you've been awed by God? When's the last time you marveled at him? I mean, the child's father and mother, Mary and Joseph, hearing these things, they just, they marveled. That's significant. When's the last time you read something in the Bible and marveled at what was said, what you read about him? And number two, we've got to become a mover. We've got to become a mover. In Luke 20, or 2, 27 and 38, just bouncing around a little bit, it says, Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, uh, to do for him what the custom of the law required. And coming up to them that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. They were so moved by this moment, Anna began to tell everyone, and Simon walked right up and said, hey, let me have this kid. <laughs> let me have this kid. I want to pray over them. I mean, what parent? I mean, mother's in here. Would, would you be okay with that? Like, who is this guy? I mean, maybe it was a little different in their culture. Maybe they could understood that what his role was in that day, and they were comfortable with that. But he just, he was a mover. He was so moved by what was going on that nothing was going to stop him from praying over that child and releasing such an amazing, uh, worshipful prayer about Jesus Christ. And Anna, she just couldn't keep her mouth shut. She just couldn't keep her mouth shut. Mary was ready to move when she, when, when she said to the angel, may it be as you have said. Remember in the story? And Joseph demonstrated that he was a mover when he woke up from his dream and did, as the angel, or did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. You remember that whole dilemma? We're engaged, and, and Joseph thought to himself, we'll just kind of quietly break off the engagement because my woman's pregnant, and it's not mine. And, and the angel came to him and said, you do this. And he moved. He went right with it. The shepherds were movers as they, when, when they said, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. And the wise men were movers as they stepped out of their comfort zone and followed a star in order to worship a king. Luke 2, 34 and 35, Then Simon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that, they, that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Those are hard words. He was revealing to her what her son was about to do. He was revealing to her that that Jesus is going to come into the world. He's going to topple everything down. He he says this child is destined to cause the falling, but then he said the rising of many in Israel. I mean, he didn't just say he's going to cause things to fall. He he was talking about rising people up, and then he was talking about what was to come with her son, Jesus, that, that she was going to be experiencing some pain as a result of that. He was moved to speak honestly and sincerely as a result of who he was looking at. And, you know, he was honest. He was bold. You ever, you ever notice a child is not afraid to speak their mind? They, they just say what's on it. You, you, could, you could create the, the most humorous of moments if you get out a video camera and you ask simple questions of children. They just, they tell you the funniest of things. Sometimes you don't even have to prompt them. They just come up and tell you things and you're just like, What? You know, and you try not to laugh because they're being really sincere and honest. You know, there have been a few times, why are you laughing at me, Dad? I'm being serious. Resurrection cannot be realized or lived until someone dies, and that's what Simon was telling Mary, is that someone, that her son was going to experience some things, but resurrection would come. The hope was there. 
And when is the last time that you found yourself at a place so overwhelmed by who God is and so excited about what is happening that you just, you cannot contain it in your, you you just, you can't. I've got to talk about this. I've got to talk about this. I've got to. If you want the faith of a child, you've, you've got to become a marveler. You've got to become a mover, too. I mean, you just got to go with it. You just got to go and share it, which brings me to the next. You got to become a messenger. It's normal that as we work at becoming marvelers, we can't stop but become movers, but it's then that it leads us to this final action step from, the, from this passage that we become messengers. Luke 2.38 says, Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Remember that old song, Go tell it on the mountain. We sang that in choir. I remember, one, actually, that was one of the songs we, we sang quite a few years over and over again. You guys just looked at me really funny when I started singing that. Um, but, like, you guys remember that song, Go Tell It on the Mountain, Over the Hills and Everywhere? Go Tell It on the Mountain. What, how's it go? That Jesus Christ is born, right? When's the last time? I mean, we got mountains and everything here. Come on. When's the last time that you've stepped outside of your comfort and your area of of normalcy and and, and thought to yourself, like a child, I'm just going to go and share it. I'm going to go and share what I feel. I'm going to go and share what what I experience. I'm going to go and share what I am. I'm I'm just going to go and tell people. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. You have family and friends who've been caught up in the, in the preparations of Christmas, and you just you need to delicately, yes, go to them and say, stop, you're going to lose a moment right now. You're going to lose an opportunity to experience the fullness of who he is. You're going to miss out. You're going to miss out because you're too caught up in everything else. When's the last time you've been a messenger? I remember this, the song we used to sing as children, you know, I'm this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Remember? Hide under a bushel. No! <laughs> I'm going to let it shine. I mean, we used to sing those songs as children, right? I mean, we talked about this in our first week. We can remember Sunday school songs, and we can remember the joy. I got, you know, the, the joy, joy, joy down in my heart. Where? You know, I mean, and, and, and we, we sing about this stuff, and we experience this stuff as children, but something happens as we grow that just, it, it destroys it. We gotta get back there. We gotta get back to that place. We gotta get back to that place. We gotta get back to that jump in our step. We've gotta get back to that place where we become messengers of the hope that we now have, that it's everywhere we are, that we sit down to dinner at a restaurant and people can't help but notice the joy emanating from our face. Not, I'm a Christian and I'm gonna grin and bear it. You know, life is hard. I know that we're gonna face persecution. I know that we're going to face challenging times, but come on. All of that pales in comparison to the fact that Jesus died for you. What does this time of year mean? Is it about, uh, and I mean, I don't want to, you know, I I don't want (laughs) to, yeah, I'm just going to say it. Is it about, is it about Santa Claus and that kind of stuff? I mean, I'm not, I, I, I'm tired of, and I'm not saying that it's Santa Claus's fault because, I mean, you know, he's a jolly guy. He means well. But, like, the way that, the way that the, the culture has created, the way that the, the businesses and companies and, and advertising, what it's done, it just messed everything up. It's all about consumerism. It's all about what I can get. People are going out Thanksgiving Day. Some people lined up three and four days in advance at an electronic store to get a dumb television. And I don't mean that to be rude, but come on. What are you doing? I mean, it's, it's an iPhone. What's the big deal? Seriously. Are we so caught up in what's going on this time of year that we've lost sight of what this really means? And are you a messenger? Are you going to go tell people? It's not about that. This is what it's about. This is what it's about. 
I thought my children were going to be mad at me for this, but I sat down with them a couple of weeks ago, and I said, tell you what, kids, we need to, we need to do some things that are generous, and I'm not about puffing myself up. I'm not telling you guys to. I'm, I'm proud of my kids because they agreed with it. But I sat down with them, and I'm like, look, you get all kinds of gifts from your grandparents. You get them all from your nieces and nephews. You got all kinds of stuff in this house already. I said, let's do something different this year. Mom and dad will, because we'll, we, we don't, yeah, we, they know that the gifts come from us. <laughs> I want credit. <laughs> um, I'm just joking. Not really. Um, but, but we sat down, and we're like, and we're like, we're like okay, this is what we're going to do this year. Because we, we, we established it a long time ago. Three gifts were enough for Jesus. Three gifts are enough for you, period. So we used to do three gifts every year. And then this year, we sat down with our kids. We're, what, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take the money that we would normally give to you, and we're only going to buy you one gift, and then the money that we would have spent on the other two gifts, we're going to give to a family in need. We're going to go buy Christmas for them. And, I mean, instantly I thought, I, I was waiting for, oh, really, Dad? No. Such joy. Because my children haven't lost sight of what this time of year really means. They, they saw the uh, they saw the, the moment and opportunity for, for generosity. Instantly, Liberty's like, do we get to go shopping for the gifts? Absolutely. We can go buy the gifts. Are we going to know the family that we're helping out? Absolutely, you're going to know the family you're helping out. I mean, they were just so excited about this opportunity for them to invest in someone else's life and, and to be a part of a generous opportunity to lift others up that that would be more a gift than anything that they would receive under the tree. In fact, Grace looked at me and said, you know what, Dad? I think that's going to be a better gift than anything we receive this year. And I'm like, that's my 10-year-old almost. And then I walked away and started crying, to be honest with you. <laughs> So proud of her. But if we lost it, we've got to become messengers. That might be through generosity, this angel tree program that some of you guys are helping out with, delivering gifts. Some of you might just need to take it upon yourself. You see someone in need, and you're like, I don't have a lot, but I have more than they have. Maybe I can go without something this year so they can go with something this year. Just maybe. Just maybe. And you think that, I mean, we're talking about material things, but sometimes that's the bridge. You give someone something, and they're like, what are you doing? What is this for? Why is this? What, what, what are you getting at? Are you, is there an ulterior motive here? Are you trying to get at something else? And you're like, no. 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 It's, 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 it's the love that's in me, and it's not even my own love. It's the love that he gave me. I can't even take credit for that because of he is, is alive in me. And, and are you going to be a messenger this year? Kids love it, man. They, they, they get a message. They get a, they get a story. You, you, ever, you ever watch a child, you know, when, when they hear something new, I mean, they just don't stop talking about it. And sometimes it's irritating. That's okay. Because they have something in them that they just got to share when my children learn something new or, you know, like, like my daughter's is, is, and I don't talk about my kids a lot because I just love them to pieces, but they're, 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 they're sitting in their bedroom reading the Bible and sometimes Grace and Liberty come out to me and be like, did you know this? Did you know that the, the, the Bible talks about this, Dad? I'm like, yeah. It's the whole marveling thing. They're just like, wow. And then they, they can't just leave it there, though. They've got to go tell people. They've got to go talk about it. They go invite their friends out to church. They got to go help their friends experience hope. They got to pray every day at, at, at lunchtime, and their friends are like, "What are you doing?" And like, I'm blessing my food. Why? Because I'm blessed to have it. So, go tell it on the mountain, <laughs> over the hills, and everywhere. I mean, go tell somebody. Go tell somebody consumeristic life is a trap and it will suffocate you. It will destroy the hope in your heart. It will. Because no amount of things that you get will ever satisfy. You've seen it in your children's lives. They, they get that one present they wanted so badly and, and I mean they're literally ripping open the package and screaming at the top of their lungs and two hours later they're playing with the box. It's happened. Three questions in conclusion. Number one, how have you lost your sense of awe? 
How have you lost your sense of awe? This is a magical time of year. And I don't want, I'm not using magical to, to make it sound different than it is. It is just, it, this time of year is just so wonderful. It brings people together. It unites people. And so many don't even know that the uniting factor of this time of year is the fact that we are celebrating the Son of God's birth. But have you lost? How have you lost your sense of awe? How are you just going through the motions? Oh, it's Christmas time again. It's that time of year, you know. Uh, number two, has it been a while since you've been moved by this true story of Christmas? Has it been a while it's mo- since it's moved you? I mean, really affected you, really changed you, really, really did something significant in your heart? I mean, are, are you just like, so many others just kind of desensitized to all of this. You, you watch the children at this time of year, and there's like a twinkle in their eye. There's so much joy. For, for those kids who have not had the, the joy ripped from them, even from, I mean, there have been times that, that, you, that I've, I've been with families before, and you think to yourself, there is no reason for this kid to have joy at this time of year because of all that they have went through, and you can still see a glimmer of hope in them. It's hard to kill hope in a kid. It is. They're resilient. They are resilient. They're moved by this time of year. It just, man, it's just like, wow, it's Christmas. It's Christmas. When's the last time you really thought yourself, uh, thought about it like that? Oh, wow, it's Christmas. This is the day that I celebrate the birth of my Savior. And at last, what is your message and how are you telling it? What is your message and how are you telling it? Let's marvel again. Let's marvel again. Let's, let's just get back to the basic principle of what this time of year is. Let's walk away for a minute. Uh, pray with me for just a moment, guys. Just, just focus in on Jesus and just allow yourself to be detached for just a moment from, from all that society tries to cram down our throats. Just, just walk away from it for just a moment. Leave the consumeristic anticipation for what you want materialistically aside and just really imagine what this time of year really means. A virgin birth. A child that changed everything. The hope of the world as, as, as Simon was so excited for the Savior's birth overwhelmed and overcome that he just began to pray words of joy. That he was fine that if he died that night, he was, he was fine because he received his promise. I pray, Father, right now in this moment that we would just be captured by your love. That we would not be desensitized. Lord, that the blur would focus and it wouldn't focus on things, but it would focus on you. That we would marvel again. That we would truly marvel again at you. That it would move us. That it would give us a message. Lord, that we would ask ourselves honestly what we're waiting for this Christmas. And these three little things would create an environment in our heart to find what we're truly longing for. More than anything that we could receive, even receive from you, what we need most is you. We just simply need you. So come today, Lord. Help us to open our hearts to you and marvel again. It's in your wonderful name we pray, Lord. Amen.